Hello everyone, you're watching Let's Talk About Prepping. I'm Tyler, your host, and in this video we're going to continue our reading of The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan, book one of the epic fantasy Wheel of Time series. Definitely one of my favorite series, and that of many others. If you haven't been following along, I will link the past readings in the description box down below, and of course I'd suggest you catch up on those. I definitely suggest you get copies of these books for yourselves as they are wonderful and very good reading, very long-term reading for a grid-down, bug-in type situation. Anyways, let's continue our reading with Chapter 5, Winter Night. The sun stood halfway down from its noonday high by the time the cart reached the farmhouse. It was not a big house not nearly so large as some of the sprawling farmhouses to the east, dwellings that had grown over the years to hold entire families. In the two rivers, that often included three or four generations under one roof, including aunts, uncles, cousins, and nephews. Tam and Rand were considered out of the ordinary as much for being two men living alone as for farming in the Westwood. Here, most of the rooms were on one floor, a neat rectangle with no wings or additions. Two bedrooms and an attic storeroom fitted up under the steeply sloped thatch. If the whitewash was all but gone from the stout wooden walls after the winter storms, the house was still in a tidy state of repair, the thatch tightly mended and the doors and shutters well hung and snug fitting. House, barn, and stone sheep pen formed the points of a triangle around the farmyard where a few chickens had ventured out to scratch at the cold ground. An open shearing shed and a stone dipping trough stood next to the sheep pen. Hard by the fields between the farmyard and the trees loomed the tall cone of a tight-walled curing shed. Few farmers in the two rivers could make do without both wool and tobacco to sell when the merchants came. When Rand took a look in the stone pen, the heavy-horned herd ram looked back at him, but most of the black-faced flock remained placidly where they lay, or stood with their heads in their feed trough. Their coats were thick and curly, but it was still too cold for shearing. I don't think the black-cloaked man came here, Rand called to his father, who was walking slowly around the farmhouse, spear held at the ready, examining the ground intently. The sheep wouldn't be so settled if that one had been around. Tam nodded, but did not stop. When he had made a complete circuit of the house, he did the same around the barn and the sheep pen, still studying the ground. He even checked the smokehouse and the curing shed. Drawing a bucket of water from the well, he filled a cupped hand, sniffed the water, and gingerly touched it with the tip of his tongue. Abruptly, he barked a laugh, then drank it down in a quick gulp. I suppose he didn't, he told Rand, wiping his hand on his coat front. All this about men and horses I can't see or hear just makes me look crossways at everything. He emptied the well water into another bucket and started for the house, the bucket in one hand and his spear in the other. I'll start some stew for supper, and as long as we're here, we might as well get caught up on a few chores. Rand grimaced, regretting winter night in Emmons Field. But Tam was right. Around a farm, the work never really got done. As soon as one thing was finished, two more always needed doing. He hesitated about it, but kept his bow and quiver close at hand. If the Dark Rider did appear, he had no intention of facing him with nothing but a hoe. First was stabling Bella. Once he had unharnessed her and put her into a stall in the barn next to their cow, he set his cloak aside and rubbed the mare down with handfuls of dry straw, then curried her with a pair of brushes. Climbing the narrow ladder to the loft, he pitched down hay for her feed. He fetched a scoopful of oats for her as well, though there was little enough left and might be no more for a long while, unless the weather warmed soon. The cow had been milked that morning before first light, giving a quarter of her usual yield. She seemed to be drying up as the winter hung on. Enough feed had been left to see the sheep for two days. They should have been in the pasture by now, but there was none worth calling it so. But he topped off their water. Whatever eggs had been laid needed gathering, too. There were only three. The hens seemed to be getting cleverer at hiding them. 
He was taking a hoe to the vegetable garden behind the house when Tam came out and settled on a bench in front of the barn to mend harness, propping his spear beside him. It made Rand feel better about the bow lying on his cloak a few paces from where he stood. Few weeds had pushed above ground, but more weeds than anything else. The cabbages were stunted, barely a sprout of the beans or peas showed, and there was not a sign of a beet. Not everything had been planted, of course, only part, in hopes the cold might break in time to make a crop of some kind before the cellar was empty. It did not take long to finish hoeing, which would have suited him just fine in years past, but now he wondered what they would do if nothing came up this year. Not a pleasant thought. And there was still firewood to split. It seemed to ran like years since there had not been firewood to split. But complaining would not keep the house warm, so he fetched the axe, propped up bow and quiver beside the chopping block, and got to work. Pine for a quick hot flame, and oak for long burning. Before long, he was warm enough to put his coat aside. When the pile of split wood grew big enough, he stacked it against the side of the house, beside other stacks already there. Most reached all the way to the eaves. Usually, by this time of year, the wood piles were small and few, but not this year. Chop and stack, chop and stack, he lost himself in the rhythm of the axe and the motions of stacking wood. Tam's hand on his shoulder brought him back to where he was, and for a moment, he blinked in surprise. The gray twilight had come on while he worked, and already it was fading quickly toward night. The full moon stood well above the treetops, shimmering pale and bulging as if about to fall on their heads. The wind had grown colder without his noticing, too, and tattered clouds scudded across the darkling sky. Let's wash up, lad, and see about some supper. I've already carried in water for hot baths before sleep. Anything hot sounds good to me, Rand said, snatching up his cloak and tossing it round his shoulders. Sweat soaked his shirt, and the wind, forgotten in the heat of swinging the axe, seemed to be trying to freeze it now that he had stopped at work. He stifled a yawn, shivering as he gathered the rest of his things. And sleep, too, for that. I might just sleep right through festival. Would you care to make a small wager about that? Tam smiled, and Ran had to grin back. He would not miss Beltine if he had had no sleep in a week. No one would. Tam had been extravagant with the candles, and a fire crackled in the big stone fireplace so that the main room had a warm, cheerful feel to it. A broad oaken table was the main feature of the room, other than the fireplace, a table long enough to seat a dozen or more, though there had seldom been so many around it since Rand's mother died. A few cabinets and chests, most of them skillfully made by Tam himself, lined the walls, and high-backed chairs stood around the table. The cushioned chair that Tam called his reading chair sat angled before the flames. Rand preferred to do his reading stretched out on the rug in front of the fire. The shelf of books by the door was not nearly as long as the one at the Wine Spring Inn, but books were hard to come by. Few peddlers carried more than a handful, and those had to be stretched out among everyone who wanted them. If the room did not look quite so freshly scrubbed as most farmwives kept their homes, Tam's pipe rack and the travels of Jane Farstrider sat on the table, while another woodbound book rested on the cushion of his favorite reading chair, a bit of harness to be mended lay on the bench of the fireplace, and some shirts to be darned made a heap on a chair. If not quite so spotless, it was still clean and neat enough, with a lived-in look that was almost as warming and comforting as the fire. Here, it was possible to forget the chill beyond the walls. There was no false dragon here, no wars or as Sedai, no men in black cloaks. The aroma from the stew pot hanging over the fire permeated the room and filled Rand with ravenous hunger. His father stirred the stew pot with a long-handled wooden spoon, then took a taste. A little while longer. Rand hurried to wash his face and hands. There was a pitcher and basin on the washstand by the door. A hot bath was what he wanted, to take away the sweat and soak the chill out, but that would come when there had been time to heat the big kettle in the back room. Tam rooted around in a cabinet and came up with a key as long as his hand. 
He twisted it in the big iron lock on the door. At Rand's questioning look, he said, Best to be safe. Maybe I'm taking a fancy. Or maybe the weather is blacking my mood. But he sighed and bounced the key on his palm. I'll see to the back door, he said, and disappeared toward the back of the house. Rand could not remember either door ever being locked. No one in the two rivers locked doors. There was no need. Until now, at least. From overhead, from Tam's bedroom, came a scraping, as of something being dragged across the floor. Rand frowned. Unless Tam had suddenly decided to move the furniture around, he could only be pulling out the old chest he kept under his bed. Another thing that had never been done in Rand's memory. He filled a small kettle with water for tea and hung it from a hook over the fire, then set the table. He had carved the bowls and spoons himself. The front shutters had not yet been closed, and from time to time he peered out, but full night had come and all he could see were moon shadows. The dark rider could get out there easily enough, but he tried not to think about that. When Tam came back, Rand stared in surprise. A thick belt slanted around Tam's waist, and from the belt hung a sword, with a bronze heron on the black scabbard and another on the long hilt. The only men Rand had ever seen wearing swords were the merchant's guards, and Lan, of course. That his father might own one had never even occurred to him, except for the herons. The sword looked a good deal like Lan's sword. Where did that come from, he asked. Did you get it from a peddler? How much did it cost? Slowly, Tam drew the weapon. Firelight played along the gleaming length. It was nothing at all like the plain, rough blades Rand had seen in the hands of merchants' guards. No gems or gold adorned it, but it seemed grand to him, nonetheless. The blade, very slightly curved and sharp on only one edge, bore another heron etched into the steel. Short colons, worked to look like frayed, flanked the hilt. It seemed almost fragile compared with the swords of the merchant's guards. Most of those were double-edged and thick enough to chop down a tree. I got it a long time ago, Tam said, a long way from here, and I paid entirely too much. Two coppers is too much for one of these. Your mother didn't approve, but she was always wiser than I. I was younger then, and it seemed worth the price at the time. She always wanted me to get rid of it, and more than once I thought she was right, that I should just give it away. Reflected fire made the blade seem aflame. Rand started. He had often daydreamed about owning a sword. Give it away? How could you give a sword like that away? Tam snorted. Not much use in herding sheep now, is it? Can't plow a field or harvest a crop with it. For a long time he stared at the sword as if wondering what he was doing with such a thing. At last he let out a heavy sigh. But if I am not just taken by a black fancy, if our luck runs sour, maybe in the next few days we'll be glad I tucked it in that old chest instead. He slid the sword smoothly back into its sheath and wiped his hand on his shirt with a grimace. The stew should be ready. I'll dish it out while you fix the tea. Rand nodded and got the tea canister, but he wanted to know everything. Why would Tam have bought a sword? He could not imagine. And where had Tam come by it? How far away? No one ever left the two rivers, or very few at least. He had always vaguely supposed his father must have gone outside. His mother had been an outlander. But a sword? He had a lot of questions to ask once they had settled at the table. The tea water was boiling fiercely, and he had to wrap a cloth around the kettle's handle to lift it off the hook. Heat soaked through immediately. As he straightened from the fire, a heavy thump at the door rattled the lock. All thoughts of the sword, or the hot kettle in his hand, flew away. One of the neighbors, he said uncertainly. Master Daltrey wanting to borrow, but the Daltrey farm, their nearest neighbor, was an hour away even in the daylight, and Orrin Daughtry, shameless borrower that he was, was still not likely to leave his house by dark. Tam softly placed the stew-filled bowls on the table. 
Slowly, he moved away from the table. Both of his hands rested on his sword hilt. I don't think he began, and the door burst open, pieces of the iron lock spinning across the floor. A figure filled the doorway, bigger than any man Rand had ever seen. A figure in black mail that hung to his knees, with spikes at wrists and elbows and shoulders. One hand clutched a heavy, scythe-like sword, and the other was flung up before his eyes as if to shield them from the light. Rand felt the beginnings of an odd sort of relief. Whoever this was, it was not the black-cloaked rider. Then he saw the curled ram's horns on the head that brushed the top of the doorway, and where mouth and nose should have been was a hairy muzzle. He took in all of it in the space of one deep breath that he let out in a terrified yell as, without thinking, he hurled the hot kettle at that half-human head. The creature roared, part scream of pain, part animal snarl, as boiling water splashed over its face. Even as the kettle struck, Tam's sword flashed. The roar abruptly became a gurgle, and the huge shape toppled back. Before it finished falling, another was trying to claw its way past. Rand glimpsed a misshapen head topped by spike-like horns before Tam struck again, and two huge bodies blocked the door. He realized his father was shouting at him. Run, lad! Hide in the woods! The bodies in the doorway jerked as others outside tried to pull them clear. Tam thrust a shoulder under the massive table. With a grunt, he heaved it over atop the tangle. There are too many to hold. Out the back. Go, go, I'll follow. Even as Rand turned away, shame filled him that he obeyed so quickly. He wanted to stay and help his father, though he could not imagine how. But fear had him by the throat, and his legs moved on their own. He dashed from the room toward the back of the house, as fast as he had ever run in his life. Crashes and shouts from the front door pursued him. He had his hands on the bar across the back door when his eyes fell on the iron lock that was never locked except that Tam had done just that tonight. Letting the bar stay where it was, he darted to a side window, flung up the sash, and threw back the shutters. Night had replaced twilight completely. The full moon and drifting clouds made dappled shadows chase one another across the farmyard. Shadows, he told himself. Only shadows. The back door creaked as someone outside, or something, tried to push it open. His mouth went dry. A crash shook the door in its frame and lent him speed. He slept through the window like a hare going to ground and cowered against the side of the house. Inside the room, wood splintered like thunder. He forced himself up to a crouch, made himself peer inside just with one eye, just at the corner of the window. In the dark, he could not make out much, but more than he really wanted to see. The door hung askew, and shadowed shaves moved cautiously into the room, talking in low, guttural voices. Rand understood none of what was said. The language sounded harsh, unsuited to a human tongue. Axes and spears and spiked things dully reflected stray glimmers of moonlight. Boots scraped on the floor, and there was a rhythmic click, as of hooves as well. He tried to work moisture back into his mouth. Drawing a deep, ragged breath, he shouted as loudly as he could, They're coming in the back! The words came out in a croak, but at least they came out. He had not been sure they would. I'm outside! Run, father! With the last word, he was sprinting away from the farmhouse. Coarse voiced shouts in the strange tongue raged from the back room. Glass shattered, loud and sharp, and something thudded heavily to the ground behind him. He guessed one of them had broken through the window rather than try to squeeze through the opening, but he did not look back to see if he was right. Like a fox running from hounds, he darted into the nearest moon cast shadows as if headed for the woods, then dropped to his belly and slithered back to the barn and its larger, deeper shadows. Something fell across his shoulders and he thrashed about, not sure if he was trying to fight or escape, until he realized he was grappling with a new hoe handle Tam had been shaping. Idiot. For a moment he lay there, trying to stop panting. Coplin fool idiot. At last he crawled on along the back of the barn, dragging the hoe handle behind him. It was not much, but it was better than nothing. Cautiously, he looked around the corner at the farmyard and the house. Of the creature that had jumped out after him, there was no sign. It could be anywhere. 
hunting him, surely, even creeping up on him at that very moment. Frightened bleats filled the sheep pen to his left. The flock milled as if trying to find an escape. Shadowed shapes flickered in the lighted front windows of the house, and the clash of steel on steel rang through the darkness. Suddenly, one of the windows burst outward in a shower of glass and wood as Tam leaped through it, sword still in hand. He landed on his feet, but instead of running away from the house, he dashed toward the back of it, ignoring the monstrous things scrambling after him through the broken window and the doorway. Ran stared in disbelief. Why was he not trying to get away? Then he understood. Tam had last heard his voice from the rear of the house. Father, he shouted, I'm over here. In mid-stride, Tam whirled, not running toward Ram, but at an angle away from him. Run, lad, he shouted, gesturing with the sword as if to someone ahead of him. Hide. A dozen huge forms streamed after him, harsh shouts and shrill howls shivering the air. Rand pulled back into the shadows behind the barn. There he could not be seen from the house, in case any of the creatures were still inside. He was safe for the moment, at least, but not Tam. Tam, who was trying to lead those things away from him. His fingers tightened on the hoe handle, and he had to clench his teeth to stop the sudden laugh. A hoe handle. Facing one of those creatures with a hoe handle would not be much like playing at quarterstaffs with Perrin but he could not let Tam face what was chasing him alone. If I move like I was stalking a rabbit, he whispered to himself, they'll never hear me or see me. The eerie cries echoed through the darkness, and he tried to swallow. More like a pack of starving wolves. Soundlessly, he slipped away from the barn, toward the forest, gripping the hoe handle so hard that his hands hurt. All right, well, I think I'll call that good for this chapter. Leave some of these episodes a little shorter for you guys. Hope that was interesting. Hope you're enjoying it. And I hope you'll tune in again for the rest of chapter five in our next reading. Hope you're all doing well. Everybody stay safe out there.